The Bible is a book of truth. And the Bible tells the truth even when that truth does not paint some of its characters in their best light. The 12 disciples are a good example of that. These men had the privilege of walking and talking with Jesus and being directly impacted by his earthly ministry. And yet the pages of the Gospels that tell their story reveal that they were definitely not super spiritual superheroes. They were every bit as frail and fragile and fickle and flawed and as full of faults and failures as any of us are. They were ordinary, and that's exactly the point. If God could use them, God can use us. Luke chapter 6, we've been using this list. It's one of four places in the New Testament where the names of the disciples are listed. Luke chapter 6, verse 13, and when it was day... Jesus called unto him his disciples, and of them he chose 12. So there were many disciples. You remember the Bible references 70 that Jesus sent out at one point. But in Jesus' earthly ministry, these 12 didn't walk with him for nearly the first half of his ministry. So in that first part of Jesus' earthly ministry, it's Jesus, and he's drawing great crowds. And out of those crowds, the discipleship group gets smaller and smaller until finally we're down to 12. Can I tell you, it really works the same in local churches and in evangelistic efforts everywhere. We cast as wide a net as we can. We draw as many people as we can. But if you're going to make it to heaven, it's not just showing up and cheering on Jesus for an hour on Sunday and then calling it quits. It's a lifestyle. It's a, a life commitment. And when you make that, Jesus pulls you into this group called the disciples. So of all these disciples that were walking with him at the beginning, he chose 12, whom he also named Apostle Simon, whom he also named Peter and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon called Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James and Judas Iscariot, which also was the traitor. So, as I mentioned, there are four listings of these disciples. They're given in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, and then another one in the book of Acts, chapter 1. And then there's occasional mentions of their names in the gospel of John. He doesn't give a list, but he certainly mentions many of them. These listings appear to be organized, and this is important. Uh, they're organized into three groups with four members each, and most likely... That's based on the length of time that these men walked with Jesus or their level of, of closeness with him. Group one always has Peter at the head of the list, and it always includes the same three, Andrew, James, and John. And then group two has Philip at the head of the list, and it always includes Nathaniel or Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew. And then finally, that third group, we know least about them of all the three groups. It always has James, the son of Alphaeus, at the head. And it always includes Judas, Judas Labaius Thaddeus, or sometimes called Judas, not Iscariot. And then it has Simon the Zealot and Judas Iscariot uh, is always listed last and always with that little mention that he was the one who betrayed Jesus or he was the traitor. Now, the 12 were just like all of us. They were selected from the unworthy and the unqualified. We often mention it at communion services when we read Paul's words, who shall ever sell uh, take of, of this bread and this cup unworthily. And we always stop and explain that in communion services because we're all unworthy, uh, but we don't act unworthily. That's with disrespect or no appreciation for the sacrifice of Jesus. Uh, we don't want to act unworthily, but let's face it, we are all unworthy of his grace and his mercy and his love and his forgiveness. And that's the same uh, with these men. Every one of them, you could call them a nobody. And they were, uh, Jesus delights in calling nobodies to this day. Don't get offended at that. But he does that. He calls people, uh, Paul said, that uh, it, it's just a kind of a, a different kind of a group in the church. And that's because God doesn't want there to be ever any question about whose power is doing the work or who should receive the glory. And so he chooses ordinary saints. And I'm really happy about that because as far as I've uh, found and 
40 years of ministry and, and a, a, a few more years than that and serving God, um, I've never met any other kind of saints but ordinary saints. I've never met any super spiritual superheroes. Uh, the great men and women of God, we respect them, we honor them, we love them. But all of their giftings that bless the church around the world, when we read the scripture, it says that God gave them those gifts. And he didn't give them those gifts so they could put their name on a billboard. He gave them those gifts for the, the edification of the body. So the gifts are given really to the church. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And he's chosen the base things of the world and things which are despised. He's chosen those things, even things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. Why? Why, God? That no flesh should glory in his presence. Paul could have added in Corinth, especially, just look around and you'll see that what I wrote you is true. And uh, again, no offense, but we could say tonight and just look around and we can see that what Paul wrote is true. We're just ordinary people. Now, of the three disciples in Jesus' inner circle, James is certainly the least familiar to us. We know much more about Peter and John, not only because of the record of the Gospels and the book of Acts, but we know much more about Peter and John because both Peter and John each wrote multiple epistles. But though he is not nearly as prominent in the New Testament story, James was also one of the leaders of the church in the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts. Now, here's very important, not just for tonight's Bible study, it's very important as you read the New Testament, especially the Gospels and the book of Acts. It's very easy to get confused about the identity of James because there are several men in the New Testament all named James, as many as seven of them. But out of all of those people named James, three of them are critical to the history of the church, and then two out of the three are part of the 12 disciples. So seven James, perhaps six, seven of them in the New Testament, uh, three of them critical to the history of the church, and of that three, two of them are in the 12 disciples. So uh, here they are. First of all, there's the James we're going to talk about for a few minutes tonight. Uh, we know him in church history as James the Greater. He's the brother of John, and he's part of Jesus' inner circle. But then there's another James, even in the 12 disciples, and history calls him uh, James the Less. And there's two or three different opinions, uh, some of them comical because they think he was short or little or scrawny, and some of them just say, well, it was to distinguish him between James uh, the Greater. Uh, but James the Less, he's the son of Alphaeus, and he's the leader of that third group of four, and he's always listed as the leader, the first name uh, in the last four names of the 12. And then to complicate things further, uh, Jesus himself also had a brother named James. And this James, this is where it gets confusing because people think that the James that walked with Jesus as a disciple, one of those two, was also his brother and also wrote the book of James and also was the leader of the church council, and that's not true. So this James, the brother of Jesus, was not one of the 12 apostles or disciples. In fact, and this is interesting, the Bible tells us in John 7 and 5 that James didn't even believe in Jesus during his earthly ministry. He didn't even believe, nor did Jesus' other brothers. However, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 7 tells us that Jesus appeared to his brother James personally after his resurrection. That would probably convince you that your brother was God manifest in the flesh when he came back after he was already in the grave. And that changed everything. And that's why this third man named James, he appears later on in the book of Acts, particularly past chapter 12. He eventually becomes known as James the Just because of his devotion and his love for the law of God. 
He becomes a pillar and a leader in the Jerusalem church. And he is the one, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James, according to James chapter 1 and verse 1. So that's the three Jameses that impact the story of the New Testament church. The first two, they are in the 12 disciples, and we're going to talk about one of them tonight. The third James, James the just, he's the brother of Jesus. At this moment in the story of the New Testament, he doesn't even believe in the ministry of Jesus at all. He'll be uh, coming along later in the book of Acts. But let's return now to that first James. So this is the brother of John, and he is the least familiar of Jesus' inner circle. This James might be known to us as James the Greater, but he never even appears as a standalone character in the gospel accounts. So at the beginning, they certainly didn't know him as James the Greater. He's always paired with his younger and better known brother named John. In fact, the only time this man, James, is mentioned by himself in the entire New Testament is the book of Acts, where we read of his sudden martyrdom in Acts chapter 12. He was the first apostle to be martyred. Now, Stephen was the first martyr, but James was the first apostle to be martyred. And he's the only one of the 12 disciples besides Judas Iscariot, whose death is mentioned in the Bible. All of the others, we know about their death from extra-biblical sources. So only James and Judas Iscariot of the Twelve, only those two have their names, uh, have their deaths recorded in the Bible. James' execution wasn't the first time that Christians were persecuted or killed, and it was certainly far from the last time. But it did mark the first time that one of the apostles gave their life for the gospel. Now this relative silence that we don't really hear a lot about James in the gospel accounts. It's always James and his brother John. He's, he, he, he's, he's just not prominent. And that relative silence is quite ironic because from a human perspective, James would have seemed to have been the logical one to be the dominant disciple among the twelve. He was older than his brother John. That's why his name is always mentioned first. And his family was a prominent one in Capernaum. Certainly more prominent than the family of their fishing partners, Peter and Andrew, who are the other pair of brothers in the twelve. James and John are often simply referred to, not even by their names, but simply referred to as the sons of Zebedee. That happens multiple times in the Gospels. That signifies that their dad, Zebedee, was an important man, probably due to his family lineage, but also due to his financial success in the fishing business. Zebedee's fishing business, it was large enough to employ hired servants. We learned that in the first chapter of Mark. And Zebedee's family, they had enough status that his son John was known unto the high priest. That's how John was able to get his buddy Peter into the high priest's courtyard on the night of Jesus' arrest because the family of John, Zebedee, that family had connections to the high priest. There's even some speculation that Zebedee himself, while he was a, a fisherman and he had a business, he was a Levite. He occasionally served in the temple and he was perhaps related to the high priest's family. But whatever the reason for Zebedee's prominence, it's clear that his family's reputation reached all the way from the Sea of Galilee, where Capernaum is, it reached all the way down to the high priest's household in Jerusalem. They knew this prominent family. Now, as the elder brother from such a, a wealthy and prominent family, maybe James felt that by all rights he should have been the leader among the disciples. And maybe that was part of the underlying tension among the disciples and why they had so many disputes about which of them should be accounted the greatest. It goes on and on and on in the pages of the Gospels. In two of the lists of disciples, James' name comes immediately after Peter, even before Peter's brother Andrew. So we can safely assume that James 
was a strong leader, maybe even second in influence among the twelve. And of course, he was part of Jesus' inner circle. Only James and his brother John and Peter, only those three, were permitted to travel with Jesus to Jairus' house to see a resurrection from the dead. Only those three were allowed to join Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when the glory of God shone out through Jesus' body and he, he glowed like the sun. It was amazing. Only the three of them were permitted to pray beside Jesus privately in one corner of the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of his betrayal. So James and John and Peter, they were close to Jesus. And as a member of that small inner circle, James was permitted to see and hear and know and experience things that the other disciples did not know or see or hear or experience. So James would have been a great choice to be the leader, to be the first. And they were always arguing about who's going to be the first. James would have been a great choice to be the first. But he was only first among the 12 in one way. He was the first to be martyred. And losing James caught them all by surprise in Acts chapter 12. From the little we know about James, it's obvious that he was a man of intensity and passion. In the few statements about him and in the few incidents that involve him, you can tell he's very intense, he's very passionate. In fact, Jesus gives James and his brother John a very pointed nickname, Boanerges, the sons of thunder. So these brothers were loud and they were zealous and they were fervent and they were thunderous, whatever that means. Loud, clumsy, obnoxious. You've met people like James and John. I know you have. You might be sitting beside them. But the problem is, in the life of James and in the life of every disciple who has that nature in them, that personality, that tendency, the problem is that even sincere passion and sincere zeal can become tainted with selfish ambition and controlling tendencies. That's what we see among the twelve. Perhaps Jesus was gently scolding them when he called this pair of brothers Boanerges, when their fiery temperament kind of got out of hand. Maybe Jesus even used it as a source of humor among the twelve. We don't know, but it's certainly possible because Jesus did say some humorous things in the Gospels. Maybe he said, now, calm down, sons of thunder. We don't know. I want to say very clearly, there's certainly nothing wrong with having zeal. There's certainly nothing wrong with being passionate and fervent for the Lord. We could use a whole lot more of that. Our elders used to tell us, <laughs> I remember many of them saying, it's a lot easier to put out a little wildfire than it is to raise the dead. And so we can use some zeal and some fervency and some passion. After all, Jesus, he used, he made a huge disturbance in the temple as he used a whip to cleanse the temple and overturn tables and drive out the money changers. And when Jesus did that, the cleansing of the temple, it caused his disciples to remember this prophecy from the Psalms, Psalm 69. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. They said, look at that. Jesus is fulfilling that prophecy. He's so zealous for the house of God that he's driving out all of these distractions. So James had watched Jesus. James had seen Jesus rebuke the Jewish leaders. He'd seen Jesus with a firm hand and a flash in his eye confront demonic powers. And certainly, Jesus didn't do that in some calm, little, wimpy, soft voice. Jesus could take authority. And so James had seen Jesus' intensity and passion. Because zeal is a wonderful thing. Passion is a wonderful thing when it's used for the sake of God's kingdom. But zeal can also be used for our own kingdoms and our own selfish reasons. Paul taught that zeal without knowledge is destructive. Zeal without compassion is often cruel. And zeal without self-control is all too often deadly. So James, this James... He didn't mean to be selfish or hurtful, but his zeal sometimes just got the best of him. 
And two incidents from the Gospels illustrate the tendency of James and his brother John to sometimes just get a little bit ahead of Jesus. Anybody ever got a little ahead of Jesus and trying to make a decision? Trying to do something in your life and you just got way out there by your little old self and then realized Jesus is right back there where I left him. Well, that happened to James and to John. The first incident is when a group of Samaritans, they refused to allow Jesus and his disciples to come lodge in their village. Jesus had sent some disciples and said, we'd like to stay there in that village for the night. And these Samaritans absolutely refused to let Jesus or his disciples stay in their village. Now imagine that, because this is the same Jesus who stepped out for the Samaritans. He ministered to an anonymous Samaritan woman at a well and changed her life forever. This is the Jesus who healed a leper who was a Samaritan. The Samaritan was the only one of the ten who returned to give thanks and Jesus commended him and he was a Samaritan. Jesus even told a parable, for heaven's sake, about the good Samaritan. So no wonder when this village of Samaritans is so rude and, and so inhospitable to Jesus and the disciples, no wonder it angered James and John. And you talk about them being triggered, they were. Luke 9. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even like Elijah the prophet did? And Jesus turned and he rebuked them and he said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And what's the conclusion of the story? And they went to another village. James was the eldest of the two brothers. And if anybody should have known better, he should have known better than to be so vindictive, especially after walking with Jesus for several months. Yes, it is true that the prophet Elijah called down fire from heaven, but he did it in a face-off with the false prophets of the pagan god Baal. Furthermore, Elijah called down fire from heaven to consume a sacrifice, not to incinerate people. So they're way out of line. James' motive is dead wrong, and Jesus rebukes him for it. You don't know what manner of spirit you are of. James, you listen here. I don't come to destroy lives. I don't come to pile guilt and shame and hurt and harm on people. I come to save lives. I come to redeem people. I come to make people better than they were before I got here. I come to lift them out of sin. I don't come to push people down and shove people out and push people around. James, you got it all wrong. When people hate or oppose me, James, let me tell you what we're going to do. It's going to put us out. It's going to be a little inconvenient. But you know what we're going to do? We're going to go stay in another village. And Jesus painstakingly belabors this with his disciples. If you go to a village, if you go to a city, if you go to a town, and they don't receive you, shake the dust off your feet. Now, my goodness, preachers have had a heyday with that. I'm going to curse them and consume them. And no, just it didn't work. Go somewhere else. We got a world full of people that need Jesus. Just because you have a bad experience with one of them, don't write off the whole human race. Nobody wrote you off. That's why you're here. See, James, he had the wrong spirit. Jesus said, James, no, I just move on to another open, hungry heart. If they shut me down, if they're inhospitable, if they're rude, James, we're just going to move on. It was just a few years later. I don't know, it could be up to 14, could be just, you know, six or seven or eight. It was just a few years later that Philip, you remember Philip? He went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them in Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Without a doubt, many of the people who were saved in that great revival were the very same people that Jesus had spared when James and John wanted to burn them to a crisp. 
They ended up being apostolic believers of the first century church. So be careful who you're dismissing. Be careful who you write off. They would never, they could never, they should never. Be careful who you're writing off. Hmm, my goodness. Well, I wasn't expecting to get all hung up on that. Jesus had to correct his disciples because they could be just a little bit too exclusive. And they could put themselves first a whole lot of times. The second incident when we see James really get out of line is when James and John come to Jesus to ask if they can sit in the place of honor on his right hand and on his left hand when he sets up his kingdom. Matthew's account even records that they brought their mother to help make the request. And some scholars believe that this was actually two different conversations. In other words, Mark records the first time they came, just the two of them, and when they didn't get what they wanted from Jesus, they brought their mother with them the next time. Put a little pressure on Jesus. And of course, when the other disciples hear about this, they get angry. And they all kept arguing about who should be greatest and who should sit on the right hand and who should sit on the left hand. And they argued about that all through Jesus' earthly ministry right up until the night of the Last Supper. They were still arguing the night before Jesus was betrayed and went to Calvary. They were still arguing about who of them should be the greatest in the kingdom. And they were all wrong. But it all got started, it looks like, with James' misdirected zeal because he should have known better. He was the oldest of those two brothers. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto Jesus saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. You know what? That's a, a, a big red flag right there. Jesus, I want you to do for me everything I want. Well, good luck with that. And he said unto them, what would you that I should do for you? And they said, well, we've just got a little request. Grant unto us that we may sit one on the right hand and the other on thy left hand in thy glory. And what do you bet that John and James also had discussions about which one of them belonged on the right and which one of them belonged on the left? But Jesus said unto them, you know not what you ask. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? See, once again, James' motive is dead wrong and Jesus rebukes him for it. You don't know what you are asking. James, my kingdom is not about position. It's about people. I did not come to be served. I came to serve, to be a servant and to give my life as a ransom for many. Now Jesus asks a question that's going to come back to haunt those brothers. Can you drink of the cup that I drink of? And James and John both answer with an emphatic, yes, we can. We can do it, Jesus. But James had no idea what he was saying in that moment. Before it was all over, James would drink of the bitter cup of martyrdom in Acts chapter 12. Maybe it was even James' outspoken zeal that ultimately made King Herod his enemy. Something brought James to the attention of King Herod. Maybe it was his outspoken zeal and his way of dealing kind of harshly with people. Maybe it was that that kind of brought about his execution. Maybe he was kind of antagonistic with the gospel message. We don't know that, but here's what we do know. James wanted prominence and power, but Jesus gave him servanthood and suffering. And James would literally lay down his life for the gospel. So rewind it all back to this moment, and James is saying, Jesus, I think John and I, we deserve, we followed you. We're from a prominent, wealthy family. We're very influential. Our family even knows the high priest. We can help you, Jesus, and, and, and we'll do that, and we'll serve you, and we'll be part of your disciples. And, but when you come into your glory, when you come into your kingdom, 
Anytime you talk, you hear a human being use the word glory and they're not talking about the glory of God, that's usually another big red flag. Jesus, when you come in your glory, we want to be right there in the middle of it. We want to sit one on the right hand and one on the left. And Jesus said, you, you don't understand what you're asking. The great heroes in my kingdom are not the names that you know and recognize. They're the people who have given everything for me. And so it unfolds in the Gospels and then, of course, in the book of Acts. By the time we get about a third of the way through the book of Acts, King Herod is eager to win the favor of the Jews, and he knows that if he persecutes Christians, he'll win the favor of the Jews. So he kills James with the sword, this James, and he has Peter imprisoned. This all happens in Acts 12. But because the church prayed without ceasing, the night before Peter was to be executed by Herod, God sent an angel to rescue him out of the prison. You know this story because we've given that poor little servant girl Rhoda grief for 2,000 years. And she was the good guy in the story. She went to the door and came back and told them, Peter's standing at the door. She wasn't the problem. The church was the problem. They didn't believe God could do that. They're still praying, oh God, save Peter. Oh God, comfort Peter. Peter's standing at the door. Would you please let me in? It's cold out here. God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we're able to ask or even think. So that's that story. God miraculously delivers Peter from prison. But before you get to that miracle, you get to this tragedy. Acts 12, verse 1. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. And this was even on one of the feast days of the Jews. He was really trying to get in their good graces. Can you imagine how John felt when he got the news that his brother James had been murdered by King Herod? But even more, can you imagine how John felt and his father Zebedee, that whole family felt, when they got the news that Peter had been divinely delivered by an angel, probably from the very same prison where James had been executed? Could we just be honest in Bible study for a moment? It creates tension in your spirit when somebody else gets a miracle that you prayed for for your family and you didn't get. They were all in Jesus' inner circle. Peter, James, and John. But James died and Peter lived. James got martyrdom and Peter got a miracle. And it seems so unfair. And it is so hard to understand. And to this day when situations like that happen and one family on one side of the church, they're rejoicing because they got an answer to prayer and the x-ray's different and the diagnosis is gone and they're out of the hospital. And, they're, and then another family in the same church on the other side of the aisle, they're in mourning because their dad, their mom, their brother, their sister, their spouse, their kids, their parents, they didn't make it. One gets a miracle and one gets martyrdom. That was James and Peter. One gets a funeral. One gets a celebration around the altar. It does not seem fair. It will boggle your mind and burden your heart. It's so hard to understand on this side of heaven. Whew. Don't you know the moment James saw Jesus on his throne, he suddenly realized a couple of very important things. He looked around, and you know that he noticed this. Suddenly he notices there is no throne on the right hand and on the left hand of Jesus. There were no thrones for him and John and the rest of them to fight over. 
All there are is the four and 20 elders seated and the Bible's very clear. They're just on seats around the throne and there's only one that sits on the throne. That's so crystal clear in the scripture. And the minute James saw Jesus one second after his earthly life expired, you know that, that you know that you know that all of a sudden James realized that was pointless to argue over who's the greatest and who's the biggest and who's the most anointed and who's the most powerful and who's used most by God and who has the greatest ministry. What a pointless discussion that is because when we get to heaven, there's only one that matters and he sits on the one and only throne of heaven and anything you do and anything you are and any ministry you have, it's all for him. My, my, my. And you know that James realized something else when he heard Jesus say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. James realized that the only throne that mattered was the throne that he now bowed before. And he realized (laughs) that it didn't matter that he got martyred. Because he just got to heaven and glory and Jesus earlier than Peter. See, from earth's perspective, it's unfair to James. From heaven's perspective, it's really quite unfair to everybody else. James got there first. I know that we're so sad and it's so hard when we lose a loved one. That's our earthly vernacular. But as the cliche says so clearly, we didn't really lose them if we know where they are. And so from earth's perspective, it's so unfair and it's so hard. But from heaven's perspective... They won. They're there. They're with Jesus. I know, I know it's hard. It, it'll twist your mind trying to understand it. But they understand it instantly. I remember Sister Georgine Shaw, our great missionary. They were with us not long ago. What powerful people of God. I remember her talking about when her mom was very feeble and it, her passing was imminent. And Sister Shaw, Sister Georgine was beside the bed of Sister Cooling. And uh, she was suffering and, 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 you know, so, so weak. And they knew her passing was imminent. And Sister Shalom told us she leaned over to her mom and got right in her ear. And she said, Mom, in just a few minutes, you're going to be dancing. In just a few minutes, you're going to see Jesus. In just a few minutes, you're going to be healed. In just a few minutes. Do you know that's the Oh, my God. I'm stuck here. I'm so sorry. But, but that's the story for every child of God. You're part of a church family like this great family. You're going to see funerals. You're going to see caskets. You're going to see tears. You're going to see loss and mourning. And we're going to say some goodbyes that we would prefer not to say goodbye to those precious people. But let me tell you, in just a little while, it's all going to be over. And we're going to be around that one throne forever and forever. I just need a time out. Would you just worship God? Thank you. What a promise. What a kingdom, what a church, what a hope. Oh, we can do a little better than that, even though it's Bible study. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I read prophecy. I read Revelation and Daniel and all the rest. I, I read them just like you do. And I don't understand a lot of it just like you don't. But I know that James did get, will get, is getting to participate in this great moment. Revelation chapter 4. And the four and twenty elders. Many scholars think that's representatives of the twelve tribes of Israel and the twelve disciples. Well, if that's true, then James is there. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne, and they worship him that liveth forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created." 
Yes, I want to have a crown. I want to have a bunch of crowns when I go to heaven. I don't want to have a crown so I can have a position higher than somebody else in heaven. I just want to have a crown so whenever that moment occurs, I've got something to throw at the feet of Jesus and say, it's all because of you. I'm only here because of you. You did it all. You paid it all. All glory, all honor belongs to you. Oh, do you know who actually wrote those words? Do you know who actually saw that glorious vision? Do you know who described that victorious scene in heaven? It was John, the younger brother of James. John, who stood at the funeral of his murdered brother and wept bitter tears. He's the one that got to see that vision James was the first of the apostles to die and his brother John was the last of the apostles to die. So by the time John wrote the book of Revelation, there's not a doubt in my mind. He could see faces of all the other martyred disciples. He could see faces of people he'd pastored and saints he'd gone to church with. He could see them all in that heavenly gathering. I don't mean to just kind of hijack Bible study, but there's a great thanks in my heart for that coming day of grand reunion on the sunny banks of sweet deliverance when all the tribes you've ever faced will seem like nothing and Jesus you'll know that he is he was and he forever shall be everything that matters Whew. my goodness just take a time out lift up your hands lift up your voice and mostly lift up your thanks to God lift up your appreciation to him lift up your worship and your praise to him lift up your love shower your love upon him he's the one he's the one la <laughs> La torre de la basho, la de la bossa, de la batre bossa. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Rabosha mande raboko reba. Oh, I worship you. I worship you. And it was James' younger brother John who saw that vision. And John is very familiar to us because he wrote so much of the New Testament. A gospel and three epistles and then that powerful prophetic book of Revelation. Only Paul and Luke contribute more to the New Testament than John does. So unlike many of the others, we don't have much of a record about them. But most of what we know about John, it comes from his own writings Along with his older brother James and their friend Peter, John is a member of that inner circle of Jesus. But John, during the earthly ministry of Jesus, he's not nearly as dominant as the other two. John played a major role in the early church, but even then he mostly remained in the background. John doesn't even name himself in his own gospel. He only refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. And when we do some detective work, we can piece together, oh, that's him. And in the first 12 chapters of the book of Acts, when Peter and John are together constantly, no words of John are ever recorded because as you would expect, Peter does all the talking. But John also got his turn at leadership, mostly because he outlived all the others and he became the last surviving apostle of the first century church. This isn't in my notes, but I'm just stuck. He's the one who gets to write, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. John gets to write those. So he becomes the last surviving apostle of that first century church. And toward the end of his life, John becomes known as the apostle of love. 
It's quite remarkable, even astounding, that John gets to be known as the apostle of love in his later years. That's quite remarkable when you remember that he was originally one of the sons of thunder. James and John were inseparable in the Gospels. They're always together. So John was right there beside his older brother James through it all, eager to call down fire from heaven and eager to debate who was greatest in the kingdom. Love was not something that came naturally to John. It was something that he learned from Jesus. In his early years, John was just as aggressive and just as arrogant as his brother. John was capable of behaving in ways that hurt other people. He was filled with impatience and self-importance. He was stubborn and he was volatile in temperament. And just like his older brother, John had a lot of misplaced zeal. In fact, the only time the other gospel writers ever record John speaking for himself. This is the only time in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The only time John ever speaks up for himself, he is displaying a totally wrong spirit and attitude towards somebody who doesn't have the privilege of being part of the twelve. Mark chapter 9. And John answered Jesus saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followed not us. He didn't come along with the twelve. And we forbade him. We told him, you can't do that anymore because you're not following us. And Jesus said, forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can lightly speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. Or literally, he that's not against us, actually, they're kind of for us. That's an amazing little piece of scripture. Perfect love was definitely not something that came naturally to John. It was something he had to learn from Jesus. In his early years... He was always arguing and competing with others, even his fellow disciples. It is almost hilarious at times. In the first eight verses of John chapter 20, John mentions three times in eight verses that he beat Peter in a foot race to the garden tomb. Three times in eight verses. And we're left to wonder, at least I am, inquiring minds want to know, we're left to wonder if John called himself the disciple whom Jesus loved, if that was a mark of humility or maybe evidence of pride. Jesus loves me the best. As a young disciple, like his brother James, John was a man of extremes. But John aged well. And by the time he became a leader in the New Testament church, the Lord had brought a mature balance to John's character, and to his ministry. And that, that scripture we just read, John's like, Jesus, forbid him. Jesus, say something bad about him. He's not following with us. He's casting out devils. He's talking a lot about the power of God, the kingdom of God, but he's not part of us. So Jesus, let's forbid him. We told him he couldn't do that anymore. Jesus said, what are you talking about? Anybody that's given glory to God Anybody that's calling my name, anybody that's doing something that blesses people, would you just leave them alone? It doesn't matter if they follow after you and if they're part of your group. If they're not doing anything against you, just leave them be. Jesus is the one who told the parable about the tares and the wheat. And on that final day of judgment, God is going to sort out all this mess that today we call Christendom. I know there are hundreds of groups and tens of thousands of people all throughout our nation and every other kind of nation and they call themselves Christians and because you know the Bible and because you've experienced the new birth, it's awfully easy for those of us among the disciples to cast some kind of shade on all of those people. Would you just let Jesus deal with all of those people and how about we go after some people that don't even know the name of Jesus, have never 
darken the door of a church. Their lives are bound and shattered. How about we reach after them and when God gives us a revival, you know what? He can bring all kinds of fish into the net and into the boat. Jesus can bring all kinds of people from the north and south and east and west. But the point that he made to John is, who do you think you are that you're going to try to shut down people as a favor to me? Just let them go because my revelation still works. And if they ever receive my spirit, the Holy Ghost is given to lead and guide them into all truth. So you just keep praying for them and stop talking about them. And John would have got that years later because he was balanced. He didn't have a clue when he was a young man. John is no different than you and me. You compare that young disciple with that aged patriarch and you'll easily see that as John matured, his greatest weaknesses developed into his greatest strengths. John's a good example of what should happen to us and in us as we walk with Jesus and as we allow his strength to be made perfect in our weaknesses. When we think of John today, you look at the artwork for the Apostle John, and he's either this young, fresh-faced kid at the Last Supper, or he's this wizened old patriarch with a long white beard and a bald head, and he's writing scripture in a prison cell, typically. When we look at John today, when we think about him today, and our artists and our preachers and our theologians study him. When we think of John today, we remember this tender-hearted, elderly apostle. He's universally beloved. He's respected for his lifelong dedication to the gospel. Really, except for this Bible study, which is kind of off the beaten path, let's be honest. With the exception of something like tonight, none of us remember very much about that aggressive, somewhat arrogant young disciple that's found in the gospel accounts. Because under the control of the Holy Ghost, all of John's liabilities were exchanged for kingdom assets. John had a deep, deep love for truth. And that resonates with me and it resonates with us. And his love for truth is evident in all of his writings. He uses the Greek word for truth 25 times in his gospel and another 20 times in his three short epistles. No one in all of scripture except Jesus himself has more to say about truth than John. It was John who wrote, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. It was John who wrote down these words of Jesus, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It was John who recorded this exchange. Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And it was also John who wrote these words to saints and churches. He that says, I know God and keeps not his commandments, he's a liar. And the truth is not in him. It was John who wrote, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. When I see your church members, your church family walking in God's commandments, I know they're walking in God's truth. And it was John who wrote one of my favorite verses in the epistles. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. John wrote more about truth than anybody in the New Testament except Jesus. In his early years, John tended to be quite judgmental and harsh and exclusive with the truth. But walking with Jesus eventually taught John something that we're supposed to learn from his life. Zeal for the truth must be balanced by love for people. Zeal for the truth must be balanced with love for people or else truth 
becomes just a source of spiritual pride in us, or truth becomes an excuse an excuse for our lack of compassion for others who don't have the truth. Yes, John used the word truth some 45 times in his writings, but he also used the word love more than 80 times. You see, John was forever grateful. A crying preacher. You see, John was forever grateful that Jesus could ever love a man who once wanted to burn up the Samaritans. John was forever grateful that Jesus could love a man who was once obsessed with status and position. John, he was forever grateful that Jesus could love a man who once forsook the Lord and fled with all the other disciples. But you see, Jesus did something for John that he wants to do for all of us. Jesus loved John long enough to change him until finally John had the same kind of love for others that Jesus had demonstrated to him. And that is what transformed this son of thunder into an apostle of love. And I close with one final scripture. Because that's exactly what Jesus wants to do with all of us. He wants to balance our zeal for his kingdom and our zeal for truth and our zeal for scripture and our zeal for righteousness. He wants to balance that with a love for people because otherwise hoarding truth and zeal to ourselves, gaining knowledge at a midweek Bible study for ourselves, and it never translates into anything that could ever impact anybody else who doesn't know Jesus yet. That's quite pointless in the kingdom scheme of things. And so I close with this verse from one of John's very short epistles. He wrote, Grace be with you, mercy and peace, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. Here it is. In truth and love. You need both. It's not just having the truth and coming to church week after week and celebrating that we have the truth. And oh my goodness, what a glorious truth it is. The truth of the new birth. The truth of the oneness of God. The truth of a lifestyle that can turn your sin inside out and upside down and make you a child of God. What a glorious truth it is. But God didn't give us truth so we can have a celebration ceremony for our little old selves every week. He gave us that truth so we could combine it with the love of God for God so loved the world that he gave. John wrote that too. And so God combines that and he taught John to combine it. And my goodness, in this world that's so shattered and broken and dark and dysfunctional, you know that God wants us to combine truth and love and impact our world, starting with one step outside the door. Would you stand with me? And as you stand, would you lift up your hands? And mostly, mostly, I know that your mind, you're you're tempted to check out. Don't just yet. Would you lift up your hands? And would you lift up your voice? And would you ask Jesus, Lord God, put some love on my truth. God, put some love on the revelation I've received. God, put some love on top of the word that I know. Jesus, put some love for people in partnership with my zeal for you. Yes, 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 yes. Now reach over, take somebody's hand or put your hand on their shoulder. Let's pray for our church. God, make us a church like that. Not just a church that knows truth, but a church that loves people. Not just a church that celebrates doctrine, but a church that celebrates outreach and evangelism and lives being changed. We got to have both. It doesn't make any sense to bring them to a place that has no truth, but it doesn't make any sense to have truth and never go to where they are. Oh, I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, God. 
Just like James, just like John, Jesus, call us, change us, walk with us, talk with us, convict us, challenge us, rebuke us, correct us, direct us, just like them. If you call them, you call us. If you could use them, you can use us. Oh, I thank you, Jesus. Oh, I thank you, Jesus. The differences, the challenges, the tensions between those 12 disciples are legendary when you read the scripture. And they're all too typical. You can see yourself in the mirror when you read the Gospels and you read about these 12 men that followed Jesus. And so tensions and challenges and little issues, they're still part of the church today because we're all just human. But you look around this room, these are the brothers and sisters that you know the best in the kingdom of God because you're here every week with them and they're the ones you get to go to heaven with. And it's a beautiful thing to belong to the family of God. And as John would be known for saying in the twilight years of his life, so many in church history record this, the aged patriarch crippling around the Isle of Patmos or the city of Ephesus, he would look at all the believers that he came in contact with and he would say, little children, love one another. And I'll leave you with that. We get to be part of a great church. Little children, love one another. Amen.